Thank you, Danny. You remember that one? Nobody remembers that one? Yes? OK, 1965. Pete Seeger wrote that. And that year in December, it went to number one on the Billboard Hot 100. Of course, Pete Seeger had some help writing that song. And by help, I mean he stole it from the Bible. Because the lyrics are taken right out of the book of Ecclesiastes. And he changed it up a bit, changed the order of a few lines, and he added the turn, turn, turn part. And he tacked on a couple lines at the end, but it is the most biblical pop song ever. Here's the original version. There's a time for everything. A season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. That's the part of Ecclesiastes that made it into the song. Of course, there's a lot more to the book of Ecclesiastes, so let me read on just a little bit. What do workers gain from their toil? I've seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom, fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. So today we are wrapping up our series on rest. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And in these weeks, both Dan and Phil have uh, said this, that, that it's a struggle, that rest can be a struggle for them, and I'll say the same thing. It's, it's hard, and I'm definitely preaching to myself today. Jesus says, I will give you rest. And in our passage today, even though it never mentions directly the word rest, it's there in the undercurrent. There's a time for everything. There's a season for everything. And that means there's a time for rest. But as we're gonna see, actually making time for rest isn't easy. You probably know that. It's countercultural. It goes against the grain. Obligations nag at us and endless opportunities tempt us. Guilt tells us we can't rest. And worry sometimes makes it impossible to rest. There may be a time for rest, a season for rest, but do we really believe it? Can we really live it? And can the book of Ecclesiastes help? Was this where you expected us to end up on this rest series, the book of Ecclesiastes? Raise your hand if you thought that's where we, no, no one thought that. I don't know about you, but I can count on one hand the number of sermons I've heard on Ecclesiastes. Actually, I can count on zero hands the number of sermons I've heard on Ecclesiastes. It doesn't come up a lot in everyday conversation, and even though it's not often explicitly quoted, the wisdom of Ecclesiastes has had a profound effect on our world, on, on us, and even the things we say, our language. You know there's nothing new under the sun, right? That's right out of Ecclesiastes. If you talk about something that's impossible or pointless and it's a chasing after the wind, that's right out of Ecclesiastes. When you go to a funeral and you hear them say ashes to ashes and dust to dust, well, that's out of the Book of Common Prayer, but it's echoing the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter three, all come from dust and to dust all return. Or maybe you've been to a wedding and you've heard that line about how a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. That's right out of Ecclesiastes. 
And if you ever heard the exclamation, vanity, all is vanity, or meaningless, everything is meaningless. That's how the book of Ecclesiastes opens, and that's how it ends. So maybe we don't read Ecclesiastes very much, especially in worship, because it doesn't seem like it fits what the Bible should say. It doesn't talk about salvation, or grace, or heaven, or hope. In fact, it, it kind of seems like it talks about the opposite. That line about how people come from dust, this is the rest of the passage. Surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over animals. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from dust, and to dust all return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth? Not exactly a passage full of hope, huh? Not really something to put on a t-shirt. Okay, well, maybe, maybe um, Ecclesiastes tells us how God will vindicate the righteous. Nope. Instead, we get this. There's something else meaningless that occurs on earth. The righteous who get what the wicked deserve and the wicked who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. So, does Ecclesiastes have any good news for us at all? The opening chapters are presented as an account or a journal of a wise teacher. Perhaps it was Solomon or maybe someone inspired by Solomon. And this wise teacher seeks out wisdom and how to make sense of life. It doesn't go well. He tries everything. He devotes himself to hard work and accomplishment. He, he then indulges every pleasure. He even embraces folly. You know, like maybe the best way to most, make the most of life is to be completely irresponsible and just live it up. But nothing works. Nothing satisfies. And so then he says this. So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I toil for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows if that person will be wise or foolish, yet they will have control over the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. Even at night, their minds do not rest. Can you relate to that? I can relate to that. Now maybe you're wondering, how again did this book come to be in the Bible? After all, it doesn't sound like good news. This doesn't seem like the go-to place for inspiration or encouragement. Seriously, the writer of Ecclesiastes would have been the worst graduation speaker ever. <laughs> You've just finished your degree and you have a mountain of student loan debt. Don't worry, your degree is meaningless. Life is meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Have a great day. Maybe Ecclesiastes is meaningless. But consider this. What if you went to the doctor because you weren't feeling well? Maybe you were feeling really bad, in fact. Pain, fatigue, nausea, headaches, exhaustion. But the doctor just keeps going on and on about how things are going to be okay. It's all going to work out. Don't worry, you'll be fine. And you say, no, it hurts. I feel terrible. Can you do something for me? And the doctor says, no, it's going to be great. You go back and forth and back and forth. And finally, the doctor says, okay, yeah, you have cancer. You say, well, why didn't you tell me that in the first place? And the doctor says, well, I mean, because it's all going to work out. we got a plan. There's a treatment. Okay, great, but you know what? You still need to know what the problem is. And Ecclesiastes tells us what the problem is. It shows us the problem. It says, look around. Life doesn't make sense. It isn't fair. You know, that's the very first life lesson I remember learning as a little kid. Life isn't fair. Some people are born rich. They don't have to do anything to get ahead in life. 
Others, lots of others, are born poor. And you know, sometimes hard work doesn't pay off. All the beautiful people have advantages that the ordinary and the ugly don't have. You can do everything right, but things blow up in your face. You can be the kindest, most wonderful person, and get hit by a car. You can be the biggest jerk who's mean to everybody and live to be a hundred. Life isn't fair. Now, this isn't exactly news. Do we need Ecclesiastes to tell us this? Yeah, I think so. Because it reassures us that we're not crazy. That God isn't out of touch. That his word isn't just a fairy tale. That being a Christian doesn't mean being in denial. If you read Ecclesiastes, and and you can read the whole thing in about 30 minutes, which is less time than I spent scrolling through my phone yesterday. If you read Ecclesiastes, you'll find it sounds very contemporary. Sure, it mentions kings and kingdoms and some other ancient stuff, but the philosophy is surprisingly modern, contemporary. It could have been written yesterday. In fact, it was written in an era of economic prosperity and innovation, kind of like our own. The world was transitioning from a time when economies were based on barter and trade and commodities to one in which money was pursued for its own sake. We know all about that. It was a time of great risks and great rewards and a time when people were working hard in never-ending jobs. We know about that too. Ecclesiastes even speaks to the plight of the individual in the face of huge, powerful empires, something that's still a harsh reality today. And it tells how the same things happen over and over again and how death is inescapable. Seriously, if you're feeling down, Ecclesiastes is not the first book of the Bible to go to. But sometimes you have to go to the doctor to face the truth of your health or the lack thereof. And it's important to let Ecclesiastes give us a reality check. And this is where it can really help. It tells the truth about the things that the world lies to us about all the time. The world says enough is never enough. That you'll always want and you'll always need more. The world says keep striving. That maybe that next thing will satisfy. Ecclesiastes says, says, no it won't. The world says pleasure is the answer. Oh, it wasn't enough that last time, it didn't satisfy whatever it was, food and drink, sex, experiences. Well, next time it will. Next time you'll be completely satisfied, I promise. And Ecclesiastes says, no, nothing in this life ultimately satisfies. Not pleasures, not success, not more money, not in this world. Don't buy into the lie. Years ago, I saw this glossy ad in a magazine with a photo of a guy driving his Mercedes and he was unhappy, he was dejected. Because the guy in the car next to him was driving a Rolls Royce. And that guy, of course, looked dapper and happy and his charming companion looked lovely. And yes, it was an ad for Rolls Royce. Simply the best motor car in the world. And you know you are the snootiest company if you call your car a motor car. John Rockefeller, one of the richest men who ever lived, was once asked by a reporter, how much money is enough? Do you know what he said? Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. We'll always want more. Enough is never enough. Your team wins it all. Great. What about next season? You get a raise. Great. Well, it could have been more, or that guy got a bigger raise. We could multiply examples forever. And more than that, in this world, there's always more to do. There will always be demands on your time. The work never ends. You will never get to a point where you can say you're done. When Meredith and I bought our first home, one of our family friends was a contractor named Ron, and he said to me, you know what being a homeowner means, don't you, Matt? I said, what does it mean, Ron? He says, it means you can sit anywhere in your house and see something that needs fixing. (laughs) He's not wrong. There is always more to do. And what does that mean? There will always be something or someone 
telling you that you cannot rest. But there's a time for everything. There's a time for rest. There's a time to stop striving. And a critical part of actually being able to do that, to stop, to rest, is recognizing that the demands will never let up. There will always be more opportunities and possibilities vying for your attention, more responsibilities and obligations demanding your attention. FOMO is real, right? It's easy to feel like you're gonna miss out on something wonderful. That's never gonna change. And all the while, the world keeps telling you lies, keeps telling you that you need to have the next great thing, that the next experience will finally satisfy, that maybe you will be able to have that just a little bit more that Rockefeller talked about. There's always a reason to feel like you can't rest. So let me ask you this. Do you need permission to rest? Oh, I know there are slackers out there, people who shirk their responsibilities, and I've done my share of slacking. And if you go to the other uh, famous book of wisdom in the Bible, Proverbs, there are plenty of exhortations to work hard. This is my favorite one. As a door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard turns in his bed. I always wanted to quote that one. <laughs> Sluggards, yeah, the Bible talks about sluggards. Uh, these last few weeks, we've been getting our house ready for winter, and believe me, it does not pay to be a sluggard and put things off. I was just talking to one of my older and wiser neighbors, and he said to me, Matt, he's, he's lived up there a long time, and he said, I always used to try to get things done before the snow flies, and then I decided to get things done before the rains come. Now I just get things done when it's sunny. <laughs> Wise words. <laughs> Hard work is important, it matters, but I'm still gonna ask, do you need permission to rest? Or maybe the question is, what's keeping you from rest? Do you doubt that God will provide? Do you fear that you won't have enough? Do you feel like it's all on you? Or do you feel guilty, like you should be doing more? Is that a legitimate sense of guilt, or is it a false sense of guilt? Or maybe you feel like you can't rest because you'll miss out. It's that FOMO thing. Are you afraid of missing out on something really great? Are you worried about the world passing you by? Or maybe you get sucked in by all the things that seem like rest but aren't. You worked hard all week, and so you feel like you've earned the right to binge watch that show or do all the super fun but super demanding things, and by the time Monday rolls around, you're more exhausted than ever. Maybe all those things weren't real rest after all. Sometimes giving yourself permission to rest, to truly rest, is a challenge. We all do have obligations. And there are so many wonderful opportunities that we know we don't know what to do with them all. And as much as the world says, take it easy and you deserve a break today, far more often the world is feeding our exhaustion. Your phone is always demanding your attention. You watch a show on Netflix and the next one just starts right up. You don't have to do anything, it just happens. It says, watch me now. Every website and app wants to send you push notifications. Pay attention to me. Your email is overflowing with ads about super important things that you don't want to miss out on. You'll be sorry. And into all this noise, Ecclesiastes says, all things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. This world is full of toil and stress, of burdens and exhaustion, and into this world, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Life is hard, it's exhausting, and without Jesus, it's ultimately meaningless. The wisdom of Ecclesiastes challenges and exposes the lies of our world, but what are the lies that you've bought into? Maybe it's the overdeveloped sense of obligation. 
or the fear that God won't take care of you, that it's all on you. Well, then hear this. God is trustworthy. He will take care of you. It's true. There are no guarantees that life won't be hard, that we won't have to endure troubles and suffering, but even so, God will take care of you. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Maybe the lie you can't shake is that feeling of guilt that you don't deserve to rest. Well, then hear this. Rest is God's gift to you. We've said that over and over again these last few weeks, and I know it can be hard to believe, hard to accept. Rest is God's gift to you. And it's so important that we don't miss out on it, that he made it a command. Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for us, made for us, made for you. Or maybe the lie you keep falling for is the fear of missing out. Rest gets squeezed out of your life because there's so many great things demanding your time. Or maybe the things that seem like rest aren't. Just before he was arrested and put to death, Jesus says to, said to his friends, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. If we're at peace, then it's pretty fair to say that we're experiencing rest, God's rest. All those things that the world says we can't live without, all the experiences of which it says you better not miss out, none of them give the peace, the rest that Jesus gives. So maybe it's time to turn off the phone. There's a time for that. Maybe it's time to turn off the TV and the internet and the stereo and the noise. There's a time for that. Maybe it's time to recognize that the work that's demanding your attention will still be there in the morning. There's a time for that. Maybe it's time to trust that God will take care of you. It's always time for that. Maybe it's time to rest. Let's pray. Oh God, our provider, our comforter, may our restless hearts find rest in you. We swim in an ocean of responsibilities and demands and opportunities. Sometimes it feels like the waves are drowning us. Guilt drags us down. Anxiety threatens to overwhelm us. You give us rest, but so often we fail to receive it. So often our trust in you wavers. So often we bind up the lie that it's all up to us or the fear that we might miss out. Oh, Holy Spirit, reveal to us the lies we've believed. Expose them for what they are. Remind us of your promises to us, that we can trust you, that we can find rest in you, that there's a better way than the, the way of endless striving, endless work, endless worry, endless guilt, endless fear. Oh God, our provider, our comforter, our hope and our salvation, hear our prayer. Amen.